Hello, my name is Michael Barber, and I'm an Associate Professor of Instructional Design in the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University, California in Vallejo. In this video, broadly speaking, we're going to explore three recommendations for designing online and distance learning. In the very first study into online learning that I conducted as a doctoral student, I investigated the perceptions of course developers on what they felt were important principles for designing online learning. As a part of that study, one of my participants gave the quote that you see on the screen. Do not attempt to write anything. Do not attempt to construct anything until you have designed your project from end to end, from start to finish. If you fail to do this and make a misstep, Undoing that mistake usually means changes that percolate right through the web of work that you've constructed. Second thing is that when you take the time to lay out your project from start to finish, the chances are you will confer with other people, and that means you will add layers of important content to your project that would not otherwise have been there if you did not take this time. Normally, I wouldn't read directly from a slide, particularly one that was dense in text like this one. But I know this video will be translated and that this will assist those learners who are using the translation. This is what I believe to be the first recommendation. Plan out the full learning experience before you begin designing it. Now, one of the frameworks that a teacher could use as they plan out their course is the Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, which was originally conceived of by the Center for Applied Special Technology, or simply CAST, as they are now referred. Generally speaking, UDL is based on the premise that students should be provided flexibility in both how they access the material and how they demonstrate that they have learned that material. The image on the screen outlines the three lenses that a teacher could use when they are thinking about how to provide flexibility for their students. Another way for a teacher to think about their content through a UDL lens is by asking them themselves these questions that appear on the screen as they plan out the learning experience that they are designing for their students. The second suggestion that I have for teachers is to consider the modality of the instruction as they are designing it. If the learning is going to occur in an online context, consider what instruction you want to be delivered in a synchronous format and what instruction you want delivered in an asynchronous format. Put another way, what do you want to do live and what do you want the students to do on their own time? There are many guides out there that can help you make these decisions. One such guide is this helpful image on the screen which comes from a longer advice piece that was produced by the Center for Teaching and Learning at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec. What it suggests is that there are certain activities that naturally lend themselves to a specific modality. For example, you're watching this piece of direct instructions in asynchronous video. This lecture could have just as been easily delivered in real time during a synchronous lesson using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meets. By presenting it as a video, you, as the student, can watch it on your own time. If we had done this lecture live, you would have had the opportunity to stop me as I was presenting to ask me questions. So thinking through what you want for your students or out of your students with each piece of instruction and which modality is best for achieving those desired outcomes is important when designing online and distance learning. However, it isn't enough to consider whether something should be synchronous or asynchronous. Teachers also need to consider the distance modality as well. You're watching this video because you signed up to take an online course. But is that the only way that this could have been done? For example, I could have put this video in a CD, DVD, or flash drive, along with the visual materials in a word processing document, and sent it to you through postal mail. If you had challenges accessing the internet, or limited bandwidth, that might be a better option. However, for someone who connectivity was not an issue, this option would be a significant limitation to what I could do as a teacher in terms of interacting with the student or having them interact with other students. One of the things the pandemic has taught us though, is that there are still some very real digital divide issues 
and a student's ability to access their learning outside of school should not be constrained by their access to the internet. The third piece of advice is that just because you can do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should do something. Oftentimes, this is based on the teacher's technical ability or what they know how to use. For example, instead of presenting this video as a narrated slideshow, simply because I have access to and knowledge of a basic video editing program, I could have just recorded a video of me discussing these three recommendations against the green screen with my institutional branding as my background. Or I could have simply recorded the video of me outlining these three recommendations against the backdrop of my actual office. The question you have to ask yourself as a teacher is what are the affordances and limitations of each of these options? Put another way, what do I gain or what do I lose with each of these options? For example, if I had presented the material in these slides as a web page, it would have allowed you to click on the links and follow them to their original source. My limited video editing skills means that I don't know how to create a hotspot in this video, so I can't allow you to click on a link. Is the limitation that you can't click on a link more important than the fact that I can include a content appropriate visual to accompany my narration? Another common example is that most learning management systems allow teachers and students to post text, audio, and video in the discussion forums. However, some teachers, if they want to engage in an audio or video based discussion, take their students outside of the learning management system into a separate tool like Flipgrid or VoiceThread. As a teacher, it is important to ask yourself, what does a tool like Flipgrid, which is shown here, afford you and your students that the discussion form in the institutional learning management system doesn't? And are those affordances worth the fact that now students and the school personnel have to learn and support another tool beyond the institutional ones. So this has been three quick suggestions for designing online and distance learning. One, plan out the full learning experience before you begin working on designing that learning. Two, consider the different modalities that you can use to provide that learning and what each modality allows you to do. And three, just because you have the knowledge or skills to be able to use a particular tool or undertake a particular pedagogical strategy, it doesn't mean that you should. Ask yourself, what does this tool or strategy afford me and my students? And is it worth the challenges or limitations that come with it? And while I've presented these as recommendations for designing online and distance learning, the truth is that these are three useful pieces of advice for designing a learning experience in any context.